Hey, our City Church, welcome. It's Pastor Chris here. If we haven't got the chance to meet yet, I wanna say thank you for coming on in and a big thank you to whoever invited you or shared this with you. That's a huge part of our heart at Our City Church is to share what we see God doing in our life and hope uh, that our friends will have their life impacted the same way. So welcome on in. If you have a Bible, I wanna invite you to open it up to John chapter nine. Uh, we're gonna read through a story that is just for me, it's a powerful story. It's an encouraging story, um, and it's a challenging one. And I'm, I'm hoping today that we as a church will grow as a community to live out more of who we see and believe that Jesus is. If you are not uh, a Christian or a Bible reader or you wouldn't consider yourself uh, even a Jesus follower, uh, I want to put you at ease and let you know you don't need to believe what we believe to belong here, to be a part of our community, to take part in what we're doing. We want you to learn about what we do believe about the Bible and Jesus and I am a Bible guy, I'm a Jesus guy, but I wasn't always, and so I want you to know I'm glad you're here, and I hope that you can study along with us and that this will impact your life and, and change it for the better. Um, I, one of the things I want to talk about before we kind of set up um, what we're going to talk through today in this story is a, a change in me that I've noticed, and I don't know about you, uh, but I have definitely noticed um, a shift in my emotional response to certain like social context, okay? Uh, and I'd like to hear from you real quick especially if you're in the chat, go ahead and say yes and how it's happened for you. Have you noticed that there is an emotional difference in how you respond to people who cough or sneeze around you now that we're in the middle of quarantine and COVID, right? I've noticed this change in me. It's, it's a deep inner change in my heart, in my soul. And I noticed it uh, when I was in a Target where all of a sudden, like, my, I, I began to contrast how I used to respond and now I do respond. Uh, someone started coughing and then they sneezed. And all of a sudden I felt this like welling up within me judgment and anger and just like looking at them all crazy. When I used to be like, oh, God bless you. Oh, God bless you. They'd sneeze. Oh, God bless you. If you speak Spanish, Dios te bendiga, right? Like I was always like nice guy. Like, hey, oh, you sneezed. Are you okay? All right, good. If they're coughing, you're like, oh Lord, help them get through that cough. You know, like all these nice hearted things. No, not anymore, man. You start coughing or sneezing around me, I'm gonna take your temperature, okay? I'm like, wait, what's going on? You know, this person started coughing and sneezing and they were like, within proximity to me, you know? It's kind of like in my little space, my little spot where I had to walk into their mist. You know, you, you ever had to walk into someone's like, I don't know, it was like their, 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 their array after they were done walking. You're like, eh, I'm gonna go down this aisle instead. That's kind of what I felt like. But then I also noticed that in the same visit, there was someone who coughed and they, they, they sneezed and it was like they were really far away, right? They were like on the other side, way down the aisle, and they had no proximity to me at all, and I actually had no worry. I wasn't looking at them. I wasn't, I didn't have my thermometer ready to go. Like I wasn't thinking, like I need to make sure that you're not trying to give me the Rona. And it was interesting to me that when you were close to me, I was concerned for my own like well-being, of course, but then it made me remember before all this, I, I always had like a, a concern, a, 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 a prayer, a, a compassion and empathy. And I began to think about what I wanted to talk about today, that God's really laid this idea on my heart, especially in the world we're living in right now, is that we, we, we don't have to worry about the person far, far away from us, right? The, the, the person without any proximity to us doesn't cause us concern. It doesn't make us have to worry. It doesn't make us have to be uh, introspective. We don't have to do any of that, right? Because when you don't have proximity to somebody, you don't really have a whole lot of concern for it. Uh, I don't know if if you've noticed this, but like, have you ever noticed that when you go through something, now all of a sudden, anyone who's going through or has gone through the same thing, you have a newfound compassion for, a newfound empathy for, right? If you've never been through a divorce, when you hear about people going through divorce, it's easy to be like, oh, what happened to them? I wonder what they all did wrong until you've been through divorce, right? If you've never lost a loved one, if you've never had a parent pass away or a brother or a sister or a, a, a child um, or, or, or some, like, you know, had a miscarriage, if you've never had those things, then you have no proximity to them. It's like, oh, God bless you. Oh, we're praying for you. Thoughts and prayers, good vibes, right? We say all these like things that we don't really touch with our hearts. They're really kind of these disconnected niceties but they're really not things that you're moved by. They're not things that you're concerned with. There's not things that you're going to do anything about. And, and there's this interesting part about all of us that we all have 
you know, an interesting disconnect from, and, and it's easy to do that when you don't have any closeness to it. it. You don't need to be concerned or worried if you've never been denied access into college, you don't have compassion for that, right? If you've never dealt with like a heartbreak, like a real breakup, like a breakup that's just like ripped your heart out. If you've never dealt with racism, if you've never dealt with being fired for something that you knew was, was unscrupulous or just not fair, or you were, you were, you were a downsize, but you're like, man, I, I know this isn't right. If you've never dealt with either addiction in your life or an addiction in a close family member, then when you hear about family members who like can't control their kid who's addicted, it's easy for you to have your point of view when your point of view has never had proximity to the pain. But see, proximity to other people's pain gives you an opportunity to see what's going on inside of your heart. It gives you an opportunity to be introspective and say, whoa, I, I didn't know about this. If you never battled, you know, infertility or or maybe you don't know anyone in the armed services right like this last week when we had um we had those the, the marines and they uh they, they 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 drowned off the coast of southern california if you've never had anyone serve then it's just kind of like oh thoughts and prayers i you know but if you've served or if you have a son or a daughter serving right now instantly that news item is different news it's not the same there's movement going on inside of your emotions and this is interesting because for us it's easy for us to be unworried about things again that we don't have any closeness to and, and this brings me i think to what i want to talk about today because that's something that we can then look to god for and here's why because god he closed the distance between humanity and himself in Jesus, we believe that he left perfect heaven and he came to broken earth. He came into the broken system, the broken life where sin and violating what God says is the best way to live is commonplace. And he doesn't stay in perfect heaven. The Bible teaches that Jesus left perfect heaven and came down to messed up earth and he dwelt among us. And in fact, I want to read the verse to you real quick. Um, John chapter 1 verse 14 says it like this. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He dwelt among us. And, and then it goes on and says, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, from heaven, full of grace and truth. And we see that Jesus is the fullness of God's perfect grace and truth combined, that he came in. And this is what I think makes Jesus so appealing and so important in 2020, is that it's so easy for us to just put people in categories and boxes and just kind of not like them, not listen and not care. And even to have no proximity to pain that we're just like, ah, oh, don't really care about the soldiers who drown, don't really care about people suffering and struggling, don't really care about this, that, and the other. It's just kind of like, whatever, I got enough problems of my own. And, 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 and there, there's this space then where Jesus comes in and says, I, I want to show you a different way. I want to show you how to keep your heart soft. I, I want to show you how to allow yourself to stay tender in your heart so you don't harden and callous up. Because none of us want to be the kind of person that is calloused in our heart. We don't want to be the kind of person that's just so rage angry or just so quietly, silently, like just numb, just numb. Jesus wants, especially today, if you are a Jesus follower, Jesus wants us and calls us to be the portrait, the picture, the light to this world. And I want to show that to you through scripture. He actually talks specifically about that in a way that I hope will be illuminated to your mind if you're a follower of Jesus. And if you're not today, I want to show you how you in your heart, how you can learn to have more compassion and more empathy. If you've ever felt like, man, I... I act like I care about things that I don't care about. I act like I have empathy for things I don't. I just move on to the next. Then I, I want you to be able to learn how you can really sensitize that part of your heart and soul again. And Jesus deals with this. In John chapter 9, Jesus deals with a man that in his day and age would have been thought of as being cosmically judged for something that either he did or his parents did. He was born blind. Everybody type in there and then. So... If um, you're new around our city church, every week I preach from this perspective that I've always called there and then. It means if you don't know what was happening in the story of the Bible there and then, then you can never understand it in the here and now. And before I tell you what I think in the here and now it can be for your life, I want you to clearly understand the story of the Bible there and then. Because if you don't know the world, 
the Bible was written into, then the words of the Bible can never really make sense or line up for you. Here's what John 9 has going on. Jesus has this blind man, and he is before him, he's in front of him. And back then, if you were born blind, the belief system was you sinned in a former life, right? Karma, like you sinned in a bad life, you did bad before, so now you're born again in a new life and you're reincarnated and now you're blind. Or your parents sinned and so now God is judging your parents by making you blind. And if you were honest, there's a lot of you right now that you still wrestle with figuring out what if that is true, right? When you mess up, you're kind of like, dude, God's going to get me, right? Like when, when, if you've sinned, if you've got a secret thing going on in your heart that you know is between you and God, you're kind of like, oh, where's it, where's it going to, where's it going to hurt someone? Is it going to hurt me? Is God going to get my kids because I messed up? And some of you have this idea of guilt and shame and, and a fear of the bigness and greatness of God. And then you look at your mistakes and you think that's how it is. Well, that's the way they thought and Jesus actually teaches us like what he really does do and what he does not do and what we believe as Christians and as followers of Jesus and of the Bible what we're supposed to show the rest of the world so let's get into it it says in John chapter 9 verse 1 it says this as he went along he saw a man blind from birth now you know a little bit about how they're thinking verse 2 his disciples asked him ready for the question rabbi who sinned not did someone sin it's a known conclusion, and these are Jesus' disciples. Do you understand that? These are his closest followers. These are the ones that will be charged with taking the message of Jesus and taking it around the world to 2020, our city church, right here and now. Help them, Lord, as they go help others. And so what you have is like a certainty in their mindset, their theology, their belief system, their understanding of God, of the Bible, of Scripture is... These are followers of God, and they're like, yeah, the guy's blind. Some, someone sinned. Who did it? Was it him or his parents? Concluding a question, not open-ended question. And they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And this is where we start to learn about how God really works and what Jesus really wants you and I to know. Verse 3, neither. Ugh. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. So Jesus actually takes a run at karma right there. He kind of just in one statement says, yeah, the whole like you lived before and sinned and now you're born blind. Not true. Neither. That didn't, that's not how it works. Whoa. Okay. But this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And then he goes on and he's going to share something. So he's talking about, wait a minute. That means that when we're looking for fault, sometimes the fault fault isn't that there was a former life sin or that your parents sinned or that you sinned and so that's why now you've got this bad thing happening jesus is like no that's actually not the way it works there's something else going on well what is it he continues he says as long as it is day we must do the works of him who sent me he's referring to his father in heaven where he came from perfect heaven to broken earth right um and then he continues night is coming when no one can work. I want to start that verse over again. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. We, we must do the works. He's including these disciples with bad theology. He's including these knuckleheads who want to argue about stuff that doesn't matter. He's including these, these non-theologians, these, these, these ones he's charging with, you know, changing the world. He's saying, we must do the work of the Father. Whoa, wait a minute. So he's, first of all, correcting bad theology. Nobody sinned. That's not how it works. In fact, there's something God is going to do even in this blind man's life, in his parents' life, in, in the people who have known him, grew up with him, knew him. God is always at work doing something. It doesn't mean there's not broken stuff on the earth. It just means that God wants to show his glory, not like shh, making everything perfect, but coming in and redeeming what isn't perfect. And then he says, look, this is, this is how this is going to go. As long as it is day, we have to do the works of the Father because night is coming. What Jesus is referring to is the work of the Father, which is to redeem all of humanity into right relationship with God. That's what the Father wants. The Father's love for you, the Father's love for me, is to bring us back into right relationship with him through Jesus' perfect life and his perfect love extended to you. So 
That's the work, is to share that story, to let people know the good news that Jesus does love and does want to forgive and doesn't want you to ever be afraid of God getting even with you, that God doesn't seek that. He seeks relationship, not revenge. That is the work. The work is to go share that, to build a church, to build a, a, a life that, that shows that and invites people to discover that for themselves and where all that life can heal and bring alignment to. He says, that's the work, okay? We've got work to do. And then he says, we've got to do the work while it's still day because there is nighttime coming. Now, this nighttime he's referring to is actually a telling of the story of him dying on the cross. I am going to die and nighttime will come. And when that happens, the work can't get done, obviously, at night. This is in a world that had no electricity. So for them, the, the idea of nighttime meant instant darkness. There was no light in the sky. There was no street lights. There was no glowing city lights in the far off distance. It was just dark everywhere you looked. So he says, look, we've got to do this while there is some light. We're going somewhere. Watch this. Now, in verse 5, this is where it gets really, really powerful. Verse 5, he says this. Right after he says, night is coming when no one can work, we must do the work of him who sent me. That means you and I, we're included, even though we have bad theology, think blind people get judged for previous lives or, or parents get judged. Like, not getting it, not understanding it, asking questions that, like, nowadays we'd be like, well, no, duh, that's not how God works. And what a terrible God that would be. Yes, but they were with Jesus and didn't get it. And even still, he had plans for them. Why? because he knew their heart. He knew they wanted to learn. He saw deep into their potential. And then he says this, verse five, a very famous verse if you're a Christ follower or a Bible reader. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. These two verses are very important to understand because he is saying, look, I am the light of the world while I'm in the world. But what does that actually really require you to think about? Okay, what happens when you're not in the world? What does that mean? Where's the light go? You just said darkness is going to happen. So how's, where do we get light from then? And this is what's awesome. is actually right here, we get the inside look of what we will see throughout scripture and even throughout the book of John. John will re refer to this, is that Jesus is building his mission, his mandate, his church through you and through me. Jesus just said, we must do the work of him who sent us. Then he says, it's going to get dark because, and he's referring to him dying. And then he says, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. But when I'm not in the world, the we I discussed, the, the you and me, guess who becomes the light of the world? You become the light of the world. You are the church. You are my people. I am giving you a calling. I'm giving you a mandate. I am inviting you to be the, the bearers of my image, to, to, to be the ambassadors on behalf of my, my love. I'm, I'm calling you to go and to fight for the right things, to stand up for those without a voice, to be able to be generous and help those that can't help themselves or in most need. I'm inviting you to be the light to the world. Not because you have the power to show that light, but because I put my light in you and you are to shine it to those in need of it who are in their own darkness. People found in pain, found in struggle, found in darkness need you and I to go be the light of the world. And what did the light of the world do so he could light up your world? He left perfect heaven and came to broken your life and he lit your life up. Why? Because you valued his values. You loved and appreciated his love. You always did what he asked you to do. No, no, he did it because he loved you and he saw value in you and he created you for high purpose and wanted to redeem the purpose even if you and I break up that purpose with our foolish and selfish decision making, he still saw value in you. And then he invites you and I to say, go be the light of the world. Go be as I was to you. Go be to them also. Go show them their value. Go show them Jesus. Go show them me. How? By doing what I did. Go leave what's perfect about your life and get close enough. Close enough close enough to those who sometimes don't agree with you, don't understand you, don't value you the way we didn't and often don't value the things of Jesus and still give the light of Jesus to the world. It's a calling. It's a mandate. It's a reference to us. And then he's now not just done because now he's going to show us his power 
and how he wants us to be a part of it. Watch this. Now he continues, verse 6. After saying this, he spit on the ground, super non-COVID at the time, by the way. He spit on the ground, and he made some mud with the saliva and the dirt and put it on the man's eyes. He takes mud. He creates mud. And he puts mud on the man's eyes. And then he says to the blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the scripture teaches us that the word Siloam means sent, to be sent. Okay. So the man went and washed and he came home seeing. I think if this verse would have been written in 2020 or in our day and age, I feel that often what happens is the reverse of what this happened. In, in there and then what happened was the man went because Jesus invited him to and asked him to in the most unusual circumstances. It didn't make sense. First of all, you spit. Then you made mud. Now you've wiped mud on my eyes. Hey, super cool guy. Thanks, Rabbi. Thanks, Son of God. Thanks, thanks Christian. This is like the worst way to do it. But he's doing something I think will translate really well here. And he says, go wash in the pool. The Bible says that it was as he went to wash and then he did the washing. Then he came home seeing. If this was in today's age, we would want to hear how many different people first had had their eyes opened when they had washed before we would even walk towards the water. And Jesus says, will you go? Will you do? Will you be? Will you be obedient? Will you trust? Will you put faith in something you can't control? Will you put faith in something before you can make sure that you make sure? Because here's the deal. Often we want to control things we have no power over. This guy's blind. He don't have the ability to know how it's going to work out. And yet he obeys and he listens to Jesus and he goes and he is able to come home seeing. Can you imagine what it would have been like to come home finally? When you were blind in that day and age, you had to beg, you had to borrow, you had to be poor, you were on the side of a road, people had to lead you everywhere. When his eyes opened up, he saw a world you and I have never seen unless we've been healed of blindness. You know why? Because I'm telling you right now, if somebody's never seen something and they see it for the first time, they see it different than those looking at it every day. If you've ever traveled abroad or traveled you know, in the United States and your first time seeing something, the first time you lay eyes on a beach and you see it, you're like, Oh my gosh, but those of you that get to the beach all the time are like, eh, I guess it's a beach. If you've always been around the snow, the snow's not a big deal to you. Take someone who's never been around the snow and they're like, oh my gosh, the snow's so amazing, it's so beautiful, it's pure and white, and it's just crazy. You see snowflakes? Like they freak out. Why? We do this when we've never encountered something before. This man had never seen trees, he'd never seen a face, he'd never seen walking, he'd never seen a horse. He'd never seen his mom. He'd never seen his dad. He'd, he'd never seen a hug. He'd never seen hands get held. He'd never seen someone pray. He would never saw anything. And now the first thing that this man gets to see is, is, is unbelievable to him. And he sees something brand new like he's never seen before because his eyes have been opened. And I believe it's the same with us. In 2020, I think church and friends all around the world watching and our guests here today that our world needs people of faith who will be able to do what happened here. First and foremost, Jesus gets into proximity with a man who's blind. Then he gets into the mud with him and he's in his situation. Then he takes it personal to be able to help this blind man. Does Jesus heal every blind person that is on the earth while he was on the earth? No, he did not. There were a lot of blind people when Jesus ascended and went up to heaven, okay? When you go to Acts, you read the rest of the book of John and you read all of Acts, we know that Jesus ascended after he rose from the dead. He goes and meets with these disciples. He commands and commissions them. You're the light of the world. Now go take the light of the world out. It's your job to do as I have done for you. I've left what was perfect and came to what was broken. I didn't stay where it was awesome for me. I was in heaven, angels flying around singing my name. We're all trying to get to that life. We're trying to get to the place where like every time we tweet or say something or put something on Instagram, everyone's like, you're the best, amazing, and oh my God, you're so wonderful. How do I have you as a friend? Right, that's the whole world is sick with the idea of getting what Jesus left. So he could come and have proximity to those of you and I who don't even sometimes follow, care, or even have or share the same views. 
Jesus love people who didn't share the same views, who didn't appreciate his love, didn't even respect his sacrifice, didn't even look at his death and say, wow, I honor that. It is entirely human to not want to love, have empathy or compassion for people who do not honor the things you honor, the death or sacrifices that you honor and you see. It is human for you to, to disregard those people and to not have compassion or empathy and to want no proximity for. It's human, but it isn't Christian. Christian isn't human. It's Jesus. It's different. It's powerful because it's different. It's unique. And Jesus comes and does something unique because he's God and he shows us the way to be the light of the world. It would be easy to be the light to the ones you agree with. That ain't Jesus. It ain't hard. It's not kingdom. It's not the gospel. It's not the Bible. You don't need a God who's alive to do that. You need breath. That's it. Breath. And then you're like, yeah, I know how to agree with those who I agree with. But Jesus comes in and goes, look, you guys don't agree with me. You don't appreciate my sacrifice. You don't even appreciate my death. You don't listen to my words. You're not doing anything hardly to show me honor and respect. And yet I left the perfect place where I was the king of heaven and I came into a world that would reject me to a people who would not let me be their own. And now I call you my followers. Go and do likewise. Be the light of the world. Go show them who I am. Go serve them as I have served you. Go do for them as I have done for you. See, it's the same with us until we get into the mud of other people's pain, until we listen and get proximity to the things that break other people's hearts, that make them sad, make them frustrated, make them upset, make them afraid, until we learn to shut our mouths and listen. God gave you two ears and one mouth, my grandpa told me. Why? Because he wants you to listen twice as much as you talk. It's so hard to do, isn't it? Especially, especially, watch, 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 don't miss this especially with those who don't even see, appreciate, value, or respect my love, my fight, my sacrifice. And yet that's exactly what Jesus does for you. And it's what he did for me. He loves me when I don't appreciate, when I don't honor, when I don't respect it. And then he invites me to come in and to ask the right questions. See, because here's the wrong question. Who sinned? Whose fault is that? How come? How do, who do we blame? Who do we blame for all the broken things happening right now in our world? Whose fault is it? Is it, is it parents? Is it, is it a legal system? Is it bad cops? Is it bad politics? Is it bad dads, bad moms? Whose fault? Doctors, the rich, the, 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 the complaining, the, the, those that don't wanna take responsibility for their own actions, for their own community. Who can I blame for this? And Jesus invites us to a better, question. See, that's a human question. You're normal if you ask that question. You're normal if you get all supercharged up for that question. But I don't want you to be normal, church. I don't want you to be just casually average and, and the typical American human. I want you to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, to be the light of the world, to be the one that shows them a better way, a more excellent way, a different way, a Christ-like way, and it will be tough, and it will make you feel like you're dying at times, emotionally, spiritually, and that's how you know you're getting close to Jesus, when it hurts, when it's difficult, and it's painful to have proximity and, and closeness to those who just don't even get it, and yet you say, Jesus, invite a change in me like you loved me. I want to learn how to do that for someone who totally rejected you, didn't consider you, and you kept pursuing caring, loving, having empathy and compassion. You brought proximity of your love to me. I think the better question, a better question than whose fault is it? That's the wrong approach. I think it's this. Um, who can't you see because you have no proximity to them? Who is it that's invisible to you who do you need Jesus Christ to allow some of the mud of their life to get on your eyes so instead of you staying blind spiritually, Jesus can open your eyes and you can go, I've never seen this before. I, I, I've never looked at it like that before. I, I've, I never knew the pain or the fear or the worry like that before. I, I never understood it like that before. I mean, I had my views, I had my ideas, I was, I was locked into them and I, I wanna make sure everyone gets and respects what I, but 
I also want to make sure that I do what Jesus did. And I want to leave my perfect value system, my perfect worldview, my perfect ideas of what I think is perfect, where they're chanting my name and they're lining up with what I got to say. And they're saying the same thing on the signs I want to have on my heart and life. And I want to learn, I want to learn how to leave that perfect heaven and come and be the light of the world, not the light of my ideas, the light of the world. So we go, how could I hear from you and try to listen and ready? How do I get close? How do I get into proximity with enough of it that the mud gets on me? So that the mud of things that are different than me and don't even appreciate me can get on my eyes. So Jesus can say, go, go into the pool of being sent by me, Siloam, go get sent, go get sent. So as you are sent to care for others, your eyes can be opened to the humanity and the dignity of people who would put you on a cross, of people who will chant, crown him and then crucify him. And yet he still sacrifices. He invites us to be the light of that world. And it is hard to do, but not impossible. Impossible with you, totally possible if you invite Jesus to help you. And that is not a one-time prayer. That is a daily prayer, an hourly prayer, a 10-minute prayer, five-minute prayer. Some of you are going to have to keep short accounts with God for a year or two until God helps batten down the ideas of how you just want the narrative to go. And he says, I need you. We, we got to do the work of my father who sent me. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, but when I leave the world, my church, my people, my followers, my beloved, you, you become the shining light, the portrait of Jesus to the world. So, who can't you see? Whose mud needs to get on your eyes so it can open your eyes? Because this is what I believe, church, and this is what's important for us, is that Jesus doesn't want us finding out whose fault it is as much as he wants us to discover that no matter what the problem is, that he's the answer. Like, whose parent was it this? Is it the media? Is it the schools? Is it our governors? Is it, the pre is it them? Is it us? Is it, whoa, whoa, whoa. He, whatever it all is, proximity to is what's going to invite a change in your heart. He wants you to be able to have proximity, and you can write this down. Proximity to determines compassion for. Proximity to determines compassion for. If you have no proximity to it, you have no compassion for it. You don't, and it doesn't matter what it is. You only have compassion for what you've got closeness to, and he invites you to a different way because Jesus had what the blind man needed. What did Jesus have that this man did not have? Jesus, first and foremost, had sight. He had sight and he saw, he knew what it was to see. The other thing he had was the power to do something, but that wouldn't have meant nothing. If Jesus had sight and the power to do something about this man's blindness and that was it, the man would still have been blind. But because Jesus had sight and he had the power to do something about it, but he also had a heart and a willingness. And to you, friend, I would say this, Jesus wants us to be the same. We have sight. We see things some people can't see, okay? He wants us to have the ability to do something about it, the power to do something about it for those that are in need of having their heart, their eyes open to who Jesus is, his love, his forgiveness, his redemption, his power. All of that is something he wants you and I to bring to this world. And listen, when it comes to people being spiritually blind, he wants you and I to be able to get close enough to the mud to be able to see it as it is and let them see Jesus as he is, maybe for the first time. And look, I think Jesus will take your heart or your willingness. Okay, he had heart and willingness. He'll take your heart or your willingness. Why? Because I believe that Jesus knows even if you don't have a heart, even if your empathy and your compassion for it is like a nil, he still would invite you to be willing. Why? Because he knows that your obedience will eventually change your heart to be more like his. So I invite you to put trust and faith in action and say, I don't know how much I have empathy. I don't know how much I have compassion, but I'll pray. I, I, I'll, I'll begin to walk the aisles differently. I'll begin to watch things that come across my screens differently. God, I wanna have a different mindset. I don't wanna have a human mindset. I wanna have a Christ following mindset that I see them the way Jesus sees them and I see my role, my mandate, my calling. We as a church community, our calling, our city is to be the light of the world so that when they see us acting, living, being, posting, shopping, loving, doing family, that they look and they go, 
that's not just normal human life. That's out of this world, different, unique, and I want whatever that is. Where did you learn? How do you have the power to be so uniquely different? And we will be able to point to the glory of the son of the living God, Jesus, who loves you and got proximity to you no matter what you thought or obeyed about him. I want to pray for you. I think right now that God wants to do a deep work inside of your heart. And so I want you to consider, is there anyone in your life, just your own personal life, not some vague idea, no, like a name, a face, a person you work with, you know, they're in your family, they're an in-law, they're married to someone you love, or you've known them and, and just things are, you know, they're dicey, they're frosty because you have not lived out being the light of the world the way Jesus invited you to. The mandate and calling to be the right kind of follower of Jesus you have come up short against, then I think the first thing that, that God wants to hear from your heart today is, God, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be the light of the world on your behalf, and I've just been the light of my own ideas, the light of my irritations, the light of my frustrations, the light of my worldview and my viewpoint, and I don't get the option to do that if I'm a Christ follower. I get the option to follow my leader, to obey his words. And he invites you to be able to cleanse your heart. You don't have to be beat up because of that. You just need to confess and repent and say, God, change me. I don't want to be like that. And the next thing is, God, who do I need to see? Whose mud and their life needs to get up and not like close enough to me to open my eyes? So, so the proximity of their pain, I'm a little closer to and I could feel what it feels like to have their pain and, and then to have empathy and compassion enter my heart like it entered your heart for me. Because I guess the, the idea I want you to consider as we close in prayer is, if Jesus treated you and thought towards you the way you think towards others, how good would this world be? I mean, if, how good would your life be? If the way you are the light of the world for everyone else and the way that you do proximity to things that don't value, appreciate you, if that's how Jesus did you, what kind of shape would you be in? Man, it would be such a tough life for me. And I want to invite us to be different, to be the church of Jesus, the light of the world, because Jesus' light shines in us and then shines through us. Let me pray for us today. God, I come before you and I ask right now for our city church and for all of our friends around the nation, around the world, that is, they're a part of this learning community. They're a part of this growing community, God. Make us more like you. Our world needs our city church because our city church knows that we need you to shine through us. You called us and invited us to be a part, God, of shining who you are to this world. May they see it different when they hear us, when they watch us, God, when they, when they res see our responses. And I ask you would do this, God, over our lives. If there's anyone in our lives, God, that we need to have a different empathy or compassion to, help us not to go into those conversations trying to make sure they know our worldview Help us to do what you did, Jesus, to leave our perfect worldview, our perfect place of being celebrated and being right all the time and come into a broken, even situation and listen and learn and love those and then give the type of empathy and compassion that only comes through proximity, Jesus. We can't do that without you, but with you, God, we could change lives. And I ask finally, God, that uh, next week as we begin to tackle and talk through our home lives or our future home, the ones we came from or the ones we want to build and all of the challenges and conflict in between that, God, would we now go be the light of the world? Help us to go invite those that need help because they're struggling, they're running on fumes, their marriages are struggling, their teenagers are struggling, their college students are struggling, their kids are struggling. God, it help us to be the light. Help us to go show that light to those that need it. And over the next few weeks, God, would you bring people back to your heart, back to your love, God, and show them what you believe their home could become. And I ask you to do that through our city church in Jesus' name. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. Hey, quick announcement for you. Next week, we are going to be moving all of our services to one time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. After that, all of them will be on demand, meaning you can watch it as many times or any part of the day as you want. It will be live at 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to be doing that mostly because we did a survey, and that's when most of you said it would be a better time for you, and so it may not work for everybody, but that's what we're going to do for the time being. We'll let you know when, when and if we want to change that, but for now, we're going to be doing that. I would love you, please. Let's go be the light of the world, church. Go invite. Go share our links. Go text it to somebody. Pray about who it is that is in your life. And let's let our city church go be what Jesus has called us to be, an invitation to a relationship with a God who loves, 
forgives and wants to be close to us no matter how broken we live or act or have been. I love you guys so much. I will see you next week, 10 a.m. at Our City Church. Have a great weekend and a great week. Bye. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris, for such an incredible message. If that encouraged you today, please take a moment and share this with one or two people that you know could use some encouragement. Well, hey, I'm super excited for next week. We have a brand new series called Home. You want to check it out. So make sure you uh, like this, you uh, subscribe, and that you share this video with one or two people. Hey, we love you. And until next week, let's change the world together.